name is Jaime de la Rey. I'm the uh, assistant department head for academics, undergraduate academics. And with me today is uh, the director of the undergraduate programs, uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Dunning, which, uh, no, Scott, I, wa I wanted you to keep that picture of you in the sun, because I wanted to understand <laughs> that we have all seasons right here in Blacksburg, Virginia. And, and uh, so Scott is actually sitting on the outside on the sunny day, and I'm sitting inside of my of my house, transmitting from the basement of my house. And on my backdrop, I have Burris Hall with some snow on it, and I hope you can see us. Also with us is uh, one of the team members of our advising group. Uh, Mary Brewer is with us as well. Once again, my name is Jaime, and for, for some of you that may be thinking about how to spell that thing in there, I always say, but this is the closest thing that you can do to my name, H-Y-M-I-E. That, that will sound plenty of good. Uh, I tell everybody, Dr. Delaware is, is a fellow in Mexico that is a cardiologist, and I don't think you want to see him. Um, I, I never like to see him because of that. And the other one is a neurologist, and it is just as bad. So none of the two I want to see. One is my uncle, the other one is my nephew. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit about the electrical and computer engineering department at Virginia Tech. We are one of the largest departments in the, in the university. Uh, we have a total of about 100 faculty, active faculty working on uh, teaching and research and service for the university. And also we have several collegiate faculty and instructors in the department making a body of about 120 active people teaching within the department. Uh, we have a, an extensive uh, research program at the graduate level and a lot of the information that we develop and, and, and we work with somehow sometimes filters down into the courses that we teach. And that's, that's gonna be pretty evident when I talk a little bit about the majors within our, within our department, besides the two, the two conventional degrees that we, that, we, um, that we hold, which is one is electrical engineering and the other one is computer engineering within the department. But each one of those two degrees have different majors underneath. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the distinction between degree and major. So we'll talk about that. So anyway, <clears throat> Some of the things you will find out once that you get into the, into the uh, ECE department is the different focus areas. I joined Virginia Tech in the, in the mid part of the, of the 1980s after I finished my PhD degree at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And when I came here, the degree was electrical engineering. Computer engineering was just a, it was a, an area of, of of um, concentration within electrical engineering, but it was rapidly changing. And by the end of the 80s, the, the, the degrees sprang aside from electrical engineering to create computer engineering. And, and within a few years later, the different aspects associated with computer engineering came pretty evident and became well-established tracks within computer engineering. Among those things, you're gonna find computer systems, you're gonna find uh, you're gonna find networking. Uh, you're gonna find uh, software and machine intelligence and very large system integration and design automation. Uh, similarly, in the area of electrical engineering, uh, the traditional, more conventional uh, aspects of electrical engineering were communications, electromagnetics, power, and controls. Those were the the strong ones. But then more development, uh, development in the area of, of uh, electrical engineering came to the development of electronic components, circuits, and systems. We talk about micro and nano systems nowadays. And also the area of photonics became very strong. And nowadays also we include space systems. So these areas are well established within the ECE department. Many of our faculty uh, form groups that support the different the, the, the different trends uh, associated with computer engineering and with electrical engineering. And we'll find out that someplace in the middle right in here, there is gonna be this fence and many people sit right by the fence and they work on well-established fields. Of, again, the cover between the two areas, computer engineering and electrical engineering. Just to name 
one that is very, very common is controlled robotics and autonomy. You'll find out that uh, in order to do controlled robotics and autonomy nowadays, the, the uh, microprocessors in sensors and power supplies in communications and computer vision are all elements of this, of this fascinating and growing uh, area of electrical and computer engineering. So anyway, now getting a little bit into the curriculum of, of our programs, electrical and computer engineering, I want you to visualize your academic, year, your academic career, your academic experience within electrical and computer engineering or within the College of Engineering at Virginia Tech, where you came in and you are right now participating of the one, one year, the common year freshman. And for some of you that are already in the second semester, you are already deciding in what direction you're going to be moving, uh, selecting between the different programs within the College of Engineering. But if you are selecting to come in, into electrical and computer engineering, you're gonna find out as soon as you walk in during your sophomore year, that right in here, you're gonna have a set of base courses. These courses are going to provide you with all the necessary tools to basically become successful on, on the future years within your academic programs. You're gonna look at the principles of electrical engineering in the area of circuits, in the area of programming, in, a, in the area of, um, of, of digital systems. And later on, would you apply some of those things to move it slightly farther into electronics, uh, microprocessors, embedded systems, and signals and systems, which are all very necessary for the following aspects of your, of your major. At the end of your sophomore year, you will find out that there is an integrated design um, lab, integrated design uh, course, EC2804, where you're gonna be applying a lot of these concepts that you learn in an integrated way, and you're gonna be jumping over fences and doing things that are, that are somehow related to circuits at the same time that you're gonna be doing some aspects related to computer engineering. The idea is to, to come to a clear understanding that we have this, this cohesive set of elements that form today's electrical and computer-based systems. Uh, the microwave in my kitchen has a microprocessor as, attached to it. Um, the, the, the television is no longer just a regular television nowadays, basically a computer. So all of those things are becoming an integrated part. And we need to understand that there is not a silo where circuits are, are completely separate and distinct from computers. They are all together. But once that you leave the sophomore year, you're gonna find out that you are able to select from a group of uh, majors. Now, here is the distinction that I was trying to, to get you to understand. The, the State Council for Higher Education in the state of Virginia has granted us the authority that we can, that we can actually assign the, the, the the degree of electrical engineer or the degree of computer engineer. Underneath the, the word of degree of electrical or computer, you can actually specialize in a specific track that is going to take you to a career, a professional world that you have a personal interest on. I'm gonna talk about those in the, next, in the next slide, but I will tell you that this major will be defined for, with something like about seven base courses. The courses are going to be somehow tuned to this specific major. And, and the majors have distinct groups of, of courses that define the specific major. In addition to that, you're gonna find three courses, which we call the secondary focus. Here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make you a little bit broader in, your, in the aspect of your own application. I'm a power engineer. I work on power systems. Uh, my area of expertise is in the area of generation, transmission, and distribution of energy. At the same time that I talk uh, about the efficient use of energy. If somebody comes and asks me today if they should include to their program something beside power systems, I would say, what do you want to do with power systems? 
Because nowadays we are talking a whole lot about the development of alternative energy sources. And as such, we are talking about solar cells and wind generation. So I should think that the area of materials is very important for somebody that is gonna get in the area of power systems, consider an alternative energy as a possible source. So I would tell that somebody could go and, develop and take three courses in the area of electronic materials, which could be very, very useful in the area of power. Also, you can think about the application of microprocessors in power systems to do power system protection, monitoring, control. Uh, so thinking that just one aspect of electrical engineering is gonna be enough, nowadays it will be actually, you're gonna be cutting yourself short. Trying to add to the program that you're taking, adding an extra aspect such as communications, controls, materials, um, cybersecurity, what a great importance nowadays. And you can select three courses uh, to define this secondary aspect. And then at your senior year, you're gonna take uh, a year uh, program, a year, two courses that define the last academic year. And you're going to basically work on an integrated senior design. And there that you're gonna be, again, jumping fences and working with people from the computer area or people from the communications area trying to implement a system. And these problems are many times defined by industry that comes to us, they give us the, pro the problem, they give us some guidance, and many times they act as the client. So you're gonna work directly with a company that is sponsoring the programs, the problems, the designs, and at the same time, you're gonna be working with somebody that is gonna be your subject matter expert. And there, what I'm trying to say is like, you, if you're working in the area of communication, you may get Dr. Harpreet Dillon or uh, Mike Buter, which work in the area of communications and they do a whole lot of work in the area of analog and digital communication. Uh, I was telling you about that fine line that defines uh, the computer and the electrical, uh, the original aspects of communication used to be analog and many, many things today are all digital. So they work on those things and support some of the activities. Um, so if you think about looking at your bachelor's degree on computer engineering or in electrical engineering, you're going to, once you finish your common year, you're gonna define your entry level right in here. You're gonna, you're gonna be talking about getting uh, straight, into, straight into the degree coming from your freshman year. And right in here is where you're going to learn all the necessary tools. Here you're gonna to be taking tools. This is gonna be circuit analysis, uh, digital systems. This is gonna be uh, the mathematics associated with our program, which is called signals and systems, um, uh, embedded systems and microprocessors. All of that is gonna come during your sophomore year. At the end of your sophomore year, you're going to, and after completing EC2804, you're gonna select your major. And, and let me take you to that page because I've been talking a little bit about it. And then I may return to this page in here. But if you decide to go into the area of computer engineering, here is some of the majors that you may pursue. Uh, the generic or the general, uh, general computer engineering program. This is, this is the degree that was basically put together probably like about 30 years ago. And is when I say that it's generic is because it's pretty broad. It includes microprocessors, it includes network, it includes cybersecurity, it includes all those aspects associated with computer engineering. However, as I was telling you, uh, faculty working actively in these programs went on to start developing very specific and well-defined tracks of expertise. Uh, ship scale integration, this is what in the past used to be called system integration. So nowadays they're putting computers and they're putting complete systems in a, just a, into a microchip. And there's a group of people that work on that. Control robotics and autonomy, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. 
And you will find these, these major in both in computer engineering as well as in electrical engineering. Machine learning, I don't think we, we're gonna hear listening about machine learning for the foreseeable future. Everything that we are doing nowadays is deploying into the, into the world systems which are computerized. And any time that we go into a computer system, we talk about several possibilities. For one thing, we can be sampling information out of the environment. We can take that information, we can store it. And, and in storage, it's gonna be a, just a bunch of images or numbers or inform, I mean, data, I'm gonna say. But what is important is to be able to process this data and extract information, information that will be useful to us to somehow create corrective measures to a process that we are trying to control or to reshape some of the applications of, of some of the systems that we deploy. And machine learning process through this wealth of, of data to extract what is valuable to us, which is information. So this is an, a growing and, and fascinating field nowadays that applies to pretty much every aspect of life. You, you will find out about that. Um, the next, next one, which is extremely important, and you probably have heard some of that, and some of that applies very, very closely to, uh, to our everyday life, banking, um, uh, our medical records, our power systems, our communication networks, all of these things, we need to make sure that as we create these networks of information, we also create the necessary boundaries of cybersecurity so we can safeguard all this private information that we wanted to keep just to our industry, our family, our own person. So very, very important. And of course, software systems is, is everywhere that we have uh, computers and we are developing software to do all kinds of things that come along to uh, in life. So that is in the area of computer engineering. I want you to think about electrical engineering on the other side. And, and again, I want you to understand that 30 years ago, when I arrived at Virginia Tech, computer, computers were courses that we taught within the, within the degree of electrical engineering, but now it's a degree on itself, okay? But a lot of the things that we do in here, they, they actually weave very, very closely with all the work that is done in the area of computers. So starting with the, with the original, with the original um, curriculum that was established probably 100, 120 years ago in electrical engineering, at that time, the areas of power systems, circuits, controls were at the beginning and then communications came along and then the other, the other aspects that I mentioned. So within electrical engineering, you can find out communication and networking. Here, I was talking to you a little bit, just a little while ago, about the work that is being done by the communications group in, in our department. They are working in the areas of analog communication and digital communication. Uh, the old telephone systems, the ones that I grew up with, you know, 50 years ago, a little more than that, were all analog based. And nowadays, uh, with the use of you know cell phones, everything has become digital. My my phone is more than a phone; is is a computer, is a is a digital camera, is a data storage. All of that information, together with with a networking device that I can transmit files, pictures, voice, anything that we want. Here is again the the one that I keep mentioning: controlled robotics and autonomy. This one I told you lives in both sides of the fence, it lives in the computer area as well as in the electrical engineering area. Uh, a lot of the processing information about acceleration, position, um, balance is done based on digital systems, but all the motors and actuators that we use are actually propelled by, by a battery that we have to manage so the robot can last long enough to do the activities that we want them to, to do. So there is a power management, there is a uh, data, um, a power storage device. 
So we have to look at the aspects from the electrical engineering as well as we look at from the computer engineering. Uh, micro nano systems, I was telling you about the area of circuits and electronics. And they nowadays we talk about micro and nano systems that are being developed and implemented in many, many uh, apparatus that we use in electrical engineering. The area of photonics, which is uh, fiber optics and, and optical systems, uh, is, is a new and fascinating and growing uh, field. Um, we have several faculty that are working on implementing sensors, fiber sensors, which are being deployed inside of the brain uh, with the idea of trying to collect signals from it and learn more um, from that. So uh, Dr. Shati Gia and some other people in that group work on the area of applications on medical applications of photonics. Radio frequency and microwave, this is the conventional way that we use the communications and still very, very active. I mean, the fact that I have this cell phone and I say that it's all digital, eventually a signal must get out of here in the form of a radio frequency, transmit to a tower that it will be repeated and then finally received at the other end. So that one's still alive, well and kicking, very, very strong. And finally, the area of space systems or space applications. And we have a group of people that work on the micro satellites um, and these little devices are gonna be deployed up in the upper atmosphere. And, and it's really interesting. I never thought about it before, but if you just think about it for, for a little bit, it makes a whole lot of sense. You take one of these satellites and you put them out in space, and the temperature environment is completely different of what it is right here on Earth. And because of that, when they design these electronic systems, they have to be designed for a completely different environment to operate on. Uh, they have to operate on um, very low pressure, um, uh, probably vacuum, and also with very extreme changes in temperature. And that makes it different when it comes to design. And there is a group of people that works on that. Uh, Dr. Scott Bailey, Dr. Mike Ruhonomy, Joe Baker, um, Greg Earl, they all work on the area of space electronics and space systems. So fascinating field again, um, that it, it just keep moving with us. So um, in terms of research, I was telling you, faculty, I mentioned that we have about 100 faculty work in the area of, of research and teaching. They have all these assets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. In the, in the area of computer engineering, we have uh, people that works on all these things in here. And you're going to notice that some of these names are somehow very, very closely related to the areas of, of, uh, that we use for teaching. Embedded and secure systems, uh, high performance computing, machine perception, network and cybersecurity, pervasive computing, and uh, system software and design technology. And these pictures in here, one of the things that I always like to talk about is this, this picture right in here. This is wearable computing. Dr. Tom Martin works in the area of wearable computing and for, for quite some time he used to work on, on this little uh, piece of fabric where they actually put accelerometers in, in, in some sensors. And with that, they could identify, if, like if I they made a vest, and you, you put it on and you can see if somebody is actually wearing that jacket right there. And the jacket was able to identify some of the activities that the person that was wearing it were doing. Uh, very important if you think about it, if you give it to people that work on dangerous environments, you may be able to detect if the person has fallen and he can't get up. We have all seen that commercial, I have fallen, I can't get up. In this case, the suit was able to detect that you, were, that you have fallen and that you were not moving. So it could be able to identify people in distress. Very, very important for people who work in dangerous environments, you know, first respondents, people who work in mines. Um, so that was a fascinating field from my point of view and applications on this uh, wearable computing that Dr. Martin was working on. Um, so there is so much to be done and in, 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 in this thing keeps going and 
one thing that, I, that many times we are terrible at doing is to somehow tell people, what is it that we do? How is it that what we do affects society and well-being? And, and as, soon as, as soon as somebody mentioned, you know, what is it that you do? I, once again, I grab my cell phone and I say, this little thing right here in my hand was actually designed by people in electrical engineering and people in electronic engineering and people in communications and people in computers. If you think about your cell phone, you have a battery pack that you wanted to manage so the energy will last you throughout the day. You have a communication system that you wanted to use to send not only voice, but you wanted to sell, sell I mean, send also digital packs. So all of that is done in there. And who can deny, you know, how much has this little device affect society nowadays? It's huge. So somehow we work behind the scenes on things that people carry on their hands without thinking who put it together. And the answer to that, I would say, is electrical and computer engineers. And we should take credit for that. And I hope you come and work with us in, in these fields. Um, in the areas of electrical engineering, um, you're gonna find out that many of these things, like I said, they sit right there on, on the fence between the two degrees. So there is a whole lot of cross talk between what electrical engineers do and what computer engineers are doing. It's, it just applies to both sides. Okay, so we talk about antenna, antennas and propagation. I don't know if you remember, but when the iPhone came out to the market, one of the first problems was that many times if you were holding the, the, the telephone the wrong way, uh, the communication will cut. And it was a, an issue that was related to the little antenna inside. They, they went on to design a new antenna. They put it differently within the enclosure that we call the iPhone. And here you are, you are now talking and doing great. So that the people in these fields work on that. Autonomous systems will work on, on the area of controlled robotics and autonomy. Energy systems, this is, in a way, I say this is me, and in a way, Dr. Scott Dunning also works in the area of energy systems. And I want you to think about this. You're too young to remember this, uh, but in 2003, we have a massive blackout in the Northeast of the United States. I don't know if you, if you know about it. It was in 2003, it was August 14, 2003. It was a hot summer day. A problem started in some place in the Midwest, some place around um, uh, south of Michigan. And an event that started there with the loss of a transmission line had actually an effect that disconnected the whole complete Northeast of the United States. Um, New York, all the way up to Maine and portions of Canada were disconnected completely from the network and they lost total power. We're talking about losses in the area in, in numbers of billions of dollars and people that were without power for uh, days at a time. So we are used to power as being a very reliable thing. We get to our apartment, we turn on the light and bingo, the light is there, always waiting for us. But the moment that it goes off, it can, can, can create uh, chaos and catastrophes. Now that is the third massive blackout to the Northeast of the United States. First one was in 1965, I was very young at the time. Then the following one was in the, in the mid seventies and the next one in 2003. You don't know how much it triggered the area of research in Virginia Tech was, was given grants for some of the technology that we were developing at the time to somehow be able to monitor, control and protect the network in a more close way. So. Great work that is being done. Um, microsystems, optoelectronics and devices. Once again, here it comes, the area of photonics that I mentioned a little while ago. That's an area of research at Virginia Tech. Multi, multi, uh, multi integrated circuits and systems, optics and photonics. Here it comes again, power electronic systems. This is, this is a fascinating area and I want, you, I want to mention it to you. You probably know that in the United States, we use 60 Hertz. The, the power that we use that comes out of the wall is 60 Hertz. And it's about 120 volts. If you go to Europe, the frequency there is 50. 
and the voltage is actually 208 volts. So what, what we, any piece of equipment that we bought that we wanted to use in the United States, if you wanted to take it with you to, to Europe, and this is years ago, you have to carry a special power supply to connect because the voltage was too high and the frequency was not the correct one. So they had to do some adjustments to the, to the power. You have to put something in between your device and the wall in the European system because the voltages were different. With the advent of power electronics nowadays, the little power supply that we buy with our computer or that we buy for our phone, they work right just rather well between here or Europe. The only thing that it requires is a different adapter, a different set of plugs, because the little plugs that we use in here and the ones that they are using in Europe are different, physically speaking. So you just need an adapter, but it's just a piece of plastic with a, some copper connection that takes you from RAM plugs to the spade plugs that we use ourselves. That's it, period. And in the middle, Power Electronics has made devices that work well at 50 or 60 hertz work well between 240 volts all the way down to about 80 volts. And that's with the advent of power electronics. At Virginia Tech, inside of the ECE department, the Center for Power Electronic Systems, CPES, on the first floor of Whittemore, is one of the most advanced centers in power electronics in the world. So it's a great place to come and learn and participate in research. I mentioned about space and atmospheric sciences, that's the space systems group. And then our input also in the area of uh, bi biology and medical applications. So wireless and secure systems, this is once again, the area of computer networking and digital communication, the issues of cybersecurity, which are so important nowadays. So those are all aspects of electrical engineering. The field is open. The areas of application are just as big as the world, and the opportunities are right there waiting for us to just come and take on them. In terms of professional uh, development, um, we offer opportunities on co-op and internships. Uh, many industry come looking for our students to go and spend the summer with them. Uh, there is also opportunities to do study abroad. I highly recommend for anyone to participate on a study abroad program. It gives you a completely different perspective of how education and the professional world changes as you change countries. Uh, many things are common. You know, the, our Ohm's law and our Kirchhoff voltage laws are all gonna be the same, but the way that we do things many times is guided by different set of standards. And many things are coming together, but it's a great opportunity to see how things are solved in a different country. Um, student organizations, plenty of them. We have the largest uh, professional group in the world, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, is very, very active. We have a chapter for our students. And then, of course, uh, some of the honor societies, such as ETA Kappa Nu uh, in our program, and the Associ Association for Computer Machinery and uh, women in computing as well is another association that we have within the department. Student projects and labs. Um, let me tell you that we have several labs which are associated with classes that we teach, but also we have labs which are kind of an open environment where you can come play, implement things that you find probably fascinating or something that you want to explore. One of those labs is the, is the AM lab the Autonomous Mastery Prototyping Lab, the AM Lab. You will find out that the lab is supported by the department. We provide parts, we provide uh, the test equipment. All of that is, is in, there. The only thing you gotta do is you gotta go through some training so you can gain knowledge of safety and procedures that we follow as we work on this environment. And then you can work, work in there with some of your peers and develop things of your own interest. Um, we have also the ECE Integrated Design Lab, which is gonna be used during 2804 and 4805, 4806. And finally, the, we are participants of the WEAR Lab, which you probably are aware of. Um, it has program, uh, projects from pretty much all aspects of engineering. 
We have people on the civil engineering working on the concrete canoe. We have um, several of the uh, cars that mechanical engineering has, the autonomous vehicles, uh, the formula, the hybrid electric car, they're all part of the wear lab. And of course, uh, you have the opportunity uh, when you are on this to participate in undergraduate research and independent studies, things that you can put together with a faculty by gaining uh, some ideas from them and then developing something that you can participate during a semester or a year. So all of those things are available in there for you. Post-graduation, the, the, the three possible things that we always talk about, uh, one is to join industry or the government. Um, this in here, this in here is the set of industry that comes and we get people from aerospace, auto industry, chemical defense, uh, gaming, hardware, health. I mean, we have everything coming to us from in terms of industry. We also advocate, um, you know, your participation on some of our graduate program, masters of engineering, masters of science or PhD in both electrical and computer engineering. Uh, uh, MBA, many of our students sometimes go and do an MBA so they can learn a little bit more about the managerial and the business side of the equation. Um, and also, I will tell you that I have seen several of our students uh, after completing their electrical and computer engineering degree, many times they work for the patent office for a little while and then they go and pursue a degree in patent law. Uh, some of the people go into the areas of medicine. And of course, applications as an officer in the military, um, either as a civilian or as a commissioned uh, officer on, on the military. So, so that's a little bit of all the things that we are working on ourselves. And the opportunities, like I said, they are great. Companies that come to us, uh, here is a, probably a not completely inclusive list, but all these people come to, uh, to EC department and seek some of our graduates. Uh, you will find there people pretty much from all the aspects of electrical and computer engineering. And then in terms of salaries, as the students graduate, you will find out that um, people getting a bachelor's degree in computer and electrical engineering will go into the fields and they will range any place between 72 to 90,000 for CPE and 54 to 74 and a half for electrical engineers. So that's a lot of information that I have thrown at you in, in just a few minutes. Um, so I would like to say thank you for coming and visiting with us. But before we go, of course, we're gonna open up the floor and see if you have any questions for me, Dr. Dunning, or for Mary Brewer that is with us today. Thanks everyone. Um, we do have a question in there right now that's asking, what is the average GPA of freshmen admitted into the School of VCE? So um, as you may already be aware, all students start at Virginia Tech in the general engineering program for their first year for that freshman year. At the end of the freshman year, students are given the opportunity to choose one of the degree granting engineering majors. Um, the the, the um, the college has a um, enrollment management system, and as if a student has a 3.0 or higher GPA that is in general engineering, they're guaranteed uh, admission into whichever degree granting major they want to go into. If they are not, uh, then if they don't have that, then it becomes a competitive basis. For our department, we have uh, in given semesters, we've accepted students all the way down to 2.0. It really just depends on the number of students who apply to our major and how many spots we have available for that particular semester. But always shoot for that 3.0. If you've got the 3.0, then you're guaranteed admission into the uh, major that you want. So the next question, I'm gonna answer that one too, um, unless, uh, Dr. Dunning or Dr. Delaray wants to jump in, but the next question is what programming languages do CPE students learn? I'll just start out and actually I will let one of them jump in, but uh, the main language that is used throughout the CPE program is C++. 
So that is used a lot, but uh, there's also other languages that are learned, also hardware languages and things like that. So I don't know if Dr. Dunning or Dr. Delaray wants to jump in and maybe answer that as well. So add to that. Well, and so we have a couple of courses that uh, <clears throat> students will gain experience with both C and C++. Uh, we use uh, programs such as MATLAB, which uh, you do programming that's like very like C, but it has uh, additional capabilities. And then depending on the track you go, we, you can do elective courses that are going to expose you to things like Python, Java, et cetera. So it really depends on um, where your focus is. For example, if you can do a computer engineering degree with an independent secondary focus in computer science, and if you want to expand the number of languages you learn. Okay, so the next question is the co-op program common for CPE. Um, I can take this one as well. <laughs> uh, I work with a lot of the students. I am uh, one of the career advisors as well. So the advisors in our department are work with our students in both the academic and career side of things. Um, the internship and co-op program is very common for our CPE students and also our EE students. Most of the time we see students doing internships in the summer. Um, I would say that about, um, we don't have exact numbers because in the summer they don't necessarily go through our program, but I would say that 75 to 80% of our students will graduate from our department and will have had at least one internship sometimes multiple internships. Uh, some will also have a co-op, which would mean that they would be in the same company uh, for multiple terms. And you can do that during, um, you know, you can do that during a, a fall or a spring semester as well, working through our career and professional development office. So uh, it is definitely common. And we found that that is one of the top things that employers are looking for uh, from our students on a resume as if they've had relevant experience. One thing we can add to that is that uh, the range of companies that uh, come to Virginia Tech, uh, Dr. De La Rey had showed you a slide with some of them. Because we have such a large student body, large companies will come to us <clears throat> that may not go to other institutions that are smaller. And so, you know, Google and Amazon aren't going to show up at a school that maybe is only going to graduate 30 students in a, in a given year. And so that's why we can attract these uh, large companies. And uh, I love seeing our students uh, check back in with us and at the range of companies that they've uh, ended up at. Okay, so the next question is, um, are there opportunities to combine other engineering majors with a minor or an emphasis in computer or electrical engineering. Um, yes, this is absolutely possible. Uh, we have a lot of students, uh, Dr. Dunning mentioned minoring in computer science. That's very popular for our, um, our students, especially our computer engineering students to do a minor in computer science um, and often can incorporate that into that secondary focus that we were talking about. We have students who are doing minors in math and physics that are a little bit more related, but also students who are doing things uh, outside of the College of Engineering as far as minors go. We also have some students, a small percentage of students who will double major uh, with another engineering, um, another engineering uh, major, say, you know, electrical and mechanical or something like that. So we, there is the opportunity uh, to do that as well. Let me add to that something else in here. And that is, when you look at this graph that I, that I talk about, and like I said, there was all this information I was trying to throw at you in just a few minutes. But this secondary focus in here is three courses, three courses that need to come from, from another one of the majors. So let's say that I decided that I'm going to go into the area of um, communications and networking. Then I decided that my secondary area is going to be in the in the area of networking and cybersecurity. So I can pick three courses from the other major to make up my secondary focus. For those people that think that they would like to do something completely away from electrical and computer engineering, they, they would like to add aspects of, let's say, biology, because they're interested in biomedical, you may go outside and find three courses that will create a path for something more advanced in the area of, of bio, biological systems with the possibility of biomedical, 
and and create your own path and somehow enhance your own your own knowledge of of uh, communications and networking and add something to it that you find an interest and you have uh, the possibility of doing a career in the future with. So that's very important to, to understand here as well. And I'll give you examples of that just um, from recent declarations, student secondary focus areas, national security, real estate, economics, music technology, nuclear energy, and nuclear energy chemistry, biomedical engineering, green engineering. So you do have a wide range there. And, and so um, I think that's a unique aspect that, that Virginia Tech has with this degree. The next question is, um, if you don't get admitted to the college as a freshman, is it possible to get in as a transfer student the next year? And if so, would that delay graduation because they would have to be in first year in general engineering? Absolutely. If you don't get in as a freshman, um, we do have students that can get in as a transfer student. Um, Virginia Community College System has an articulation agreement with Virginia Tech. Uh, so we do take students in. Does it delay graduation? It really depends on what courses you do get at the, uh, the transfer institution and how those courses transfer. Uh, many times, uh, courses, depending on what school you're transferring from, there's not always a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation with the courses, but we do work with our transfer students. Transfer students generally have the first semester in general engineering, but then they're usually able to transfer at the end of that semester. And that is the one time we do work with students in letting them continue to progress in ECE. Uh, and in, or in computer electrical engineering, even if they're still in general engineering that first semester. If they are eligible to go on and take some of our classes, we do work with them on that. I see our next one is from uh, Christina. You're asking for what advice can you give to an incoming undecided engineering student to help choose a major? Uh, Dr. De La Rey, do you want to uh, answer that one? Why don't you take the first step? The, the problem okay. is that I, I know what is happening. And, and, and I think part of the problem comes, comes from, from this set of slides in here, where we, there is so much field of application that sometimes it just is mind boggling, but go ahead. Well, so one of the things, if, you, so if you're an undecided engineering student, you're trying to find an area of interest. And um, so there's, I usually think of, of looking ahead. In other words, let's say, if I, you've started in engineering, you probably um, like solving problems. And so, and you wanna help people by using technology to make lives better. That's generally what I see from, from people in engineering. And then the question is, okay, so what of the areas, we've got all these engineering majors, and then we have um, with the engineering degrees, the sub majors we can go into, there's a lot, right? And, and I understand that. Uh, one of the things I tell people is to start trying to look at career paths, career options. For example, if you know a friend of the family that's in something, or you think an area is of interest, we can help hook you up with somebody that works in that particular degree field. Um, and the idea is you want to see what, what a job is like. That's why we encourage students to do internships uh, to track your way. But you have these broad areas, mechanical, electrical, civil, um, et cetera, chemical, biomedical. Um, and you got to think about, well, are there courses that I really enjoyed, whether they were in high school or even if, if you're an undecided in this first year, um, that might give you some insight into an area as well. All right. So uh, I, I guess what I'm going to add now is that Following this, this webinar, there is going to be a set of tours that have been organized to show you some of the labs where students, like I said, some of the labs are academic in nature. And for what I mean by that is that they are associated with a specific class in our department. However, there are some labs where it's basically hands-free. You come in and you develop things because you have your own interest. What Dr. Dunning was, was suggesting just a minute ago, you know, what is something that you find a little bit of a passion? Can, can I experience a little bit of what is it that I can do? And going there and, you know, uh, 
damage some elements, try and error, burn a couple circuits, figure out what you did wrong, what you did right, try it again, and then succeed and get the, the joy of getting the success of that. Uh, then one thing that is very important, Christina, also is many times we are looking for something that is going to have an impact, an impact to society, an impact to our own lives. And, and, and that's what I was telling you a little while ago, that many times we cut ourselves short by not being able to tell people what is it that we do. So you got to find something that you wanted to do, and then you start thinking, and that is going to bring me the, 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 not necessarily the salary, but the personal reward of knowing that you have accomplished something and something that had a, a wide area of impact. That, that is so important. And, and, and there is, like I said, there is so much to do. Um, day one, coming into the department, as soon as you start taking courses from us, we're going to equip you with uh, devices that you're going to be playing with, with the hope that you start gaining hands-on experience on, on the equipment and the materials. Um, and like I said, we're going to let you burn a few of those and then try it again until you succeed. And little by little, we start building up on your confidence and building better systems. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you later. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Lindsay.